Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 6 of our third series of painting a Song of Ice and Fire tabletop game miniatures. We've been working our way through the Stark vs. Lannister starter set, as well as some of the extra Kickstarter pledge rewards. In this series, we're going to be painting up a Ramsay Bolton, Great John Umber, and Gregor Clegane, The Mountain That Rides. Last episode, we were doing some base work, uh, base coating for our metallic areas on the miniatures, and uh, we're going to be starting off this episode by continuing on with that. Gregor Clegane, The Mountain That Rides, is an impressively large miniature for an individual unit in any sort of strategy game. Um, and he takes quite a long time to do, no matter what you are doing with him. <laughs> uh, for the metallics in this case, we're going to be doing exactly what we were doing last time, which is to say just applying this mixture of black ink, silver acrylic, and airbrush flow improver uh, evenly over all of the areas that we want to uh, paint in a metallic way later, so all of the uh, steel armor on him. What this is going to allow us to do is once the miniature has been varnished, uh, which will take off a lot of the gloss from anything, and if we had put silver paint on before the uh, matte varnish is applied, it would just turn to a flat gray and not look like anything. Um, but once we've varnished, this base coat of slightly off black will still be present, and we'll dry brush our silver paint over top of that, giving us a sort of hammered or beaten metal look. Um, with all of the lower areas pre-shaded by this base coat that we're applying right now. This isn't entirely necessary depending on what assets you have at your disposal. Um, if you have, for example, a really good thin black wash available, uh, you could also not base coat your metallic areas at this point, and instead just put metallic paint on after you varnish the miniature, uh, straight on top of the primer, and then put your black wash on that to darken the recesses and sort of pull it down from just looking like straight up acrylic paint. That being said, in this case, this is what we're doing. So just be careful as you apply the um, black metal base coat, because if this does get onto areas where it shouldn't be, it will be more difficult to remove than just your standard India ink. India inks flow very well and don't tend to adhere very strongly to a surface early on. They'll dye it a little bit, but that's about as bad as it gets. Um, however, metallic paints in particular, uh, because they're composed of these little flakes of metal within them that uh, cling to surfaces, uh, they tend to stain very, very badly. So if you do get uh, overspill of a metallic paint, prioritize wiping that away or getting it covered up as soon as possible because uh, the longer you let it sit there, just the worse it's going to be, especially when you're working with a dark metallic paint like this uh, black mixture. Given that Gregor Clegane wears mainly just yellow and this metal as well, um, it would be a very quick way to ruin all that uh, beautiful yellow that we put so much work into applying earlier. As we carry on with painting uh, the metallic areas on Greg Clegane, I'll just uh, take a little aside here. If you do want to uh, follow along with the exact same materials that I'm using in these videos, I do have uh, Amazon affiliate links in the description of this video and all other videos, including the materials that I use in that video. Uh, as an Amazon affiliate, I do earn on any qualifying purchases you make through those links. Um, which does not only include the items listed, but also any other items you buy while you are following that link to Amazon. If you do want to grab yourself some hobby making materials or any goods that uh, you think would help with the hobby or with following along with these tutorials, um, please feel free to use those links. It's a great way to support the channel on the side while also getting something for yourself. Carrying on here, the shield in particular is one area where a little bit of overspill is going to do a lot of damage. Um, because of the flat face on the front of it. Uh, if you'll recall, I had uh, quite a bit of difficulty getting an even yellow across the flat face of this because it all wanted to flow clear off. There weren't a lot of recesses and ridges for the uh, ink to cling to. That's going to be pretty common with a lot of flat areas on miniatures. Um, they seem like they should be the easiest places to paint, but if you're painting them with acrylics, they're going to get a lot of brush marks, and if you're painting them with ink, they're going to... Well, the ink's going to run, so uh, I actually <laughs> would rather a rough area with a lot of detail than a big flat area. Keeping that in mind, I'm going to be very careful as I paint these clay dogs. Um, 
I would say you could probably uh, go a little more aggressively when you do paint the Clegane dogs and just go all the way around them because otherwise you're going to make them look sort of uh, like they stand out. I do appreciate that the Song of Ice and Fire miniatures put heraldry, you know, sculpted onto their banners and on their shields and stuff so that you can just follow along with it. Um, my free hand isn't really good enough yet to be doing really nice heraldry on all of my knights and uh, medieval miniatures, which is one of the reasons I've never gotten around to painting my uh, Warhammer Britannians or my Hundred Years War miniatures. <laughs> um, it's a pretty daunting prospect, so these Song of Ice and Fire miniatures actually are pretty well suited to uh, beginners or people with less experience because they leave out the uh, rather complex act of painting all your own heraldry on. Here I'm just making sure that I don't have any overspill or anything, I'm just wiping it away with my thumb, unfortunately off camera, but uh, yeah, just a quick dab with the thumb can pull away any excess anywhere you need to. The next thing we're going to be doing here is uh, grabbing our red ink and magenta ink. Uh, and we're going to be making just a second thicker coat of red um, to lay on over top of the red areas on both uh, Ramsey Bolton and the Great John. This thicker coat is going to serve us quite well for just making the colors pop a little bit. Um, what we've got already is a fairly dusty, almost pinkish color, which you might like because it may look like, uh, you know, sun faded red uh, cloth. But uh, in, in my, you know, for, for my own decisions, I sort of looked at it and said that I'd rather it be more bright and pop a little bit more. Um, that may not be necessarily realistic, but on the tabletop, I thought the effect would be nicer if they were uh, a thicker, more even red across the uh, tabard on the Great John and the cloak on uh, Ramsey. So. That's what I'm going to go through and do. Mixing red and magenta, um, I did mention this in the previous episode, but I'll say it again for those who are just jumping in. Uh, mixing red and magenta can be quite useful for uh, deepening the red, uh, where red on its own is a sort of uh, very light color, uh, at least with these inks, um, to the extent where putting it on basically just turns pink. <laughs> it uh, It's very translucent. Um, I think the pigment is not quite as rich as it could be, maybe. Um, so it makes a fairly nice pink color or a very uh, a more subtle red, uh, whereas magenta would make obviously a sort of purplish magenta color. Uh, the blend of the two of them though adds a little bit of blue pigment or whatever it is they use to make the magenta magenta uh, and pulls down the red a little bit and makes it just a little deeper. Um, you can add a little bit of flow improver like this, but that'll also dilute your pigment, so keep that in mind. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to use it to just be able to slough a lot more of this on now um, and have it flow to the recesses without leaving tide marks anywhere. I was starting to get a little bit of a um, clear gradation between the old ink and the new ink, um, you know, marking sort of brush strokes or where I was applying it. Uh, with the flow improver, it's going to break those those uh, shapes down a little bit and flow better. It's also, uh, the flow improver has some mild thinning properties, so it'll also thin the layer beneath a little bit and help the two blend together. I do recommend using a little bit of flow improver whenever you're doing this uh, second layer of ink on top of a previous one to help with that blending. Uh, although, of course, keep in mind what uh, sort of thickness of ink or paint you're looking at uh, applying. What I'm doing here is now because I've sloughed it on, I need to draw some of it away or push it into the crevices and push it around a little bit to try and get a more even finish. Uh, it's a little tough to do, especially because the airbrush flow improver will set up to an almost solid finish um, as it uh, sort of dries out. It'll start getting kind of jelly. And if you start pushing around with this gel, it uh, doesn't sit very well. So here I'm realizing I'm maybe pushing my luck with that thin stuff and I'm going to move on to the Great John. With the Great John, again, we're being very careful and applying it around uh, the areas that we've already painted, especially that one little loop on his belt. I'm not really sure what that's supposed to be, but uh, I do want it to stay brown because it does serve as a nice little accent and break up the colors on the tabard a little bit. So we're just going to tuck in here. The nice thing about the Great John is you can really see the, uh, the zenithal highlighting we did early on when we primed them um, under sort of his gut. Uh, the bottom of his tabard there, it, it shaded quite well, um, which is encouraging. It does mean that the zenithal highlighting wasn't a waste of time. <laughs> it had a visible effect on the miniatures. So we're going to grab some uh, brown and a little bit of yellow now. We're going to mix those together and we're just going to touch up some of the brown areas. Um, 
There is quite a lot of brown on these medieval miniatures, and that's pretty common for any medieval or fantasy miniature, I think. There's a, a strong design focus for those who are sculpting them to put a lot of belts everywhere and furs and leathers and all that kind of stuff. And of course leather can be dyed uh, and with realistic miniatures I would be a little more comfortable giving them dyed leather like for example if you were looking at them um, sort of uh, like uh, brigandines stuff like that uh, of the Hundred Years War era. Uh, there are definitely some dyed examples in red, blue, that kind of stuff. Um, however, in fantasy miniatures, uh, almost invariably, the source material just shows it all being brown. Um, and I think that's supposed to, like, it gives them a really earthy tone. But even if you look at the um, design, not the design document, the um, concept art from the Song of Ice and Fire tabletop game, uh, the, the hardcover book, if you were a Kickstarter backer, um, the hardcover book is really worth getting if you can find a copy and you want to play this game. Uh, it's got all the concept art in the back. The rules are still short, succinct, and... Uh, Honestly, they look quite playable, but the um, the concept art that's in the book is invaluable for painting the miniatures. I don't follow it rote, but uh, I certainly refer to it whenever I'm a little stumped about how to paint something, and uh, it's it's quite good. But it is fantasy concept art, so they do co sort of go for you know let's make the overall palette of this guy gray and brown. So um, breaking up the brown a little bit by just mixing different proportions of yellow and brown and then going over areas you've already uh, blocked out as being brown earlier could be a really good way to just add a little bit of variety to the miniature where otherwise they're going to sort of have large shapes that are uh, blended together due to the same color. Breaking up these shapes is kind of a really important thing with miniatures I find. Uh, when it's a thing you're going to be looking at from several feet away uh, for the vast majority of its lifetime unless you're entering it into a competition or something for uh, painting but if you're uh, like me and you're you're you know playing games um you, you are going to want them to uh, stand out and the shapes to pop from a distance so color is your your best way for to do that really um you can do it a little bit with shading um shading and highlighting that does take quite a while to do um but it's very easy to just color things differently uh, at this stage and since we're doing this with inks, it sort of highlights shades a little bit for us as well, so it makes it look more detailed, even as we just sort of slather inks onto a miniature. Um, so this is a really good opportunity for you to break up the profile of your miniature and make it uh, sort of speak a little bit better to the viewer from uh, tabletop distance, just by varying the colors a little bit. Uh, the Great John's back was a really good example, with that big cross scabbard and then the um, the fur cloak if we didn't change the color of the cloak a little bit in this case to a more yellowy brown to look like a you know dirty brown bear sort of um that scabbard would have blended right in even though we tried to use a different uh, brown the first time um without uh, going in a second time to really break apart those colors it wasn't very distinct so just uh, keep that in mind, you know, uh, as you go around. You also find because I watered down my brown in this case a little bit, it uh, it did end up a little see-through. So uh, a second pass to just thicken it out can also be good just for communicating that color in general, so it doesn't look kind of pink or really really beige if you don't want it to. Of course, if you wanted to, all the power to you. Ramsey here, he's a little less on the leather because we decided to paint him in various shades of gray. Um, He's just kind of, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to go for not very many colors on him. Um, I still broke up the different layers, obviously, and, and gave him brown boots, brown belt, brown gloves with gray clothing in between. But making him overall dark seemed to fit in quite well with his personality. Um, he does look very sinister. And uh, <laughs> I, I am curious as to what exactly it is he does in the tabletop game. But uh, I'm sure I'll find out soon enough. What I'm doing here is now that uh, that um, uh, airbrush flow improver is set up a little bit in his cloak, I'm just taking a wide, clean brush and I'm sort of stippling it around and moving it, um, trying not to absorb it all and wick it away, and also trying not to brush it because brushing it's going to leave some really strong stroke marks in this uh, drying uh, ink and flow improver. But by sort of pushing it like this uh, aggressively and tapping it around and trying to just like get rid of other patterns by stippling them out um i managed to get a reasonably even looking cloak in the end when it dries out um because now at this point even if i just push a whole bunch of the ink upwards it's going to flow downwards again but it's going to flow downwards much more slowly as the medium dries out so it will flow down it'll even out a little bit and th the texture that i end up with i'm, I'm 
reasonably happy with um, as far as making it look like a like a cloth cloak instead of um, you know like a sheet of plastic or whatever the the kind of impression you get when you've done a cloak all in a single color of acrylic and it's this really flat you know it's a beautiful finish flat color but it just kind of looks like it's a uh, um, fiberglass cloak or something that's hanging off of someone's shoulders <laughs> so anyway I do that now I'm just sort of wiping away the raised areas um, because by wiping them away obviously the concentration of ink on them is gonna be lesser and they're gonna end up a little bit brighter uh, so I'm helping that shading process happen This is uh, very much one of those places where it's, uh, you know, art rather than science. Just sort of uh, tap away and do what you, you see fit. Um, the nice thing about this stuff, honestly, is uh, if you don't like something, you can always paint it over again later. If you want to see a good example of that, you can take a look at the uh, previous season where I did Cersei Lannister. I, um, I think I did three, four different attempts at uh, giving her a base that I liked before I finally settled on... A stony base which ultimately ended up being too much work so that's not what i do for my non-combat units anymore anyway so you know just experiment and and you can always kind of make up for it um and if everything really does go to pot we have um methods of stripping miniatures right i do have a let's get technical on stripping miniatures from a while ago when i had a little more free time and could make the spare episode um I go over sort of the, the value of stripping and how I go through stripping my miniatures. And in fact, those miniatures are going to be painted in various seasons as we move forward. Um, so do look out for that. Uh, stripping is a really valuable technique and it is um, something to have in your back pocket to give you a little more confidence moving forward to just sort of paint a thing and then carry on. With that finally being said, uh, we have finished yet another episode. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, or I hope you learned something. Um, if you did, check it down in the comments, let me know. Um, if you want to see anything in the future, let me know in the comments. I am on Instagram, and I'm on Facebook as well. You can reach me through there. Um, and if you're on Instagram and Facebook, you'll follow along with where the painting projects are actually at, rather than where the uh, episodes are at in terms of coming out, if that makes sense. Yeah, anyway, uh, thanks again for watching. I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something. Uh, happy Canada Day, and go play some games.